I'm wondering, what comes to your mind? Birds. 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 Uh, anything else? Art. Art. Beauty. Nature. Beauty. Nature. Well, actually, Audubon is noted for three things. Art. I'm not an artist. his son 
Victor and John did and the ones that he did. He also had the help of a man named Bachman um, in the text for this. But just, I'll show you more later, but just to show you, he did, here's the New England, New England squirrels. 33 different squirrels are in this book. And also the larger animals. Here's caribou. Now, earlier in America, they estimated there are about 2 million <coughs> caribou. But of that number, there's probably only 10% of those left. The northern states in Canada. Uh, the other books, I, I recommend any of these to you. Uh, Audubon's America by Donald Colross Petey uh, includes a lot of his journal, and he did a most interesting journal of all his trips. The first uh, 18 years of his adulthood, he was traveling many months at a time to Florida, up to Labrador, um, and he this tells not only about the nature of the time that he, as a naturalist, but what it was like to live in those times, early 19th century America. Uh, this one, Audubon by himself, that's a very famous picture of him. And these other books are also great, and they're in the Weathersfield Library, just for your using your library card. I like this one particularly, Audubon's Birds of America by, uh, text by George Duck, Harry Abrams is the publisher, and they always do nice artwork. Um, I, I brought it along especially because of the colorful, pictures that were copied from the set they have in the uh, Historical Society in New York, original set. And this is bright and nice, brighter than my slides will be, so look, look at these colors. Now the next one makes me think of Mill no Woods, <laughs> the Mallard Ducks. Now, Myra Miner made a wonderful contribution to, to, to today's presentation. She gave me a calendar that, from 1994 that was um, made by the uh, New York Historical Society in connection with the Boston Museum of Fine Arts. So these were also made from that original the original set that they have. And let me just show you how nice they are. Uh, these are all extinct or endangered birds. Uh, that's what this particular year, year was. Um, the passenger pigeon, that ha there were the most of any birds in, uh, no, in America, are all gone, <coughs> extinct. Uh, the Carolina parakeet, gone, Bachman's warbler, there was one, the last time one was seen was in 1900, so they think they can call it extinct, but that, that really is, is sad, isn't it? The whooping crane is endangered, and the rest of these are all uh, endangered too, and it just seems too bad, but it's wonderful that uh, Audubon saved these for us in his pictures and his journals. Um, I have a few pictures that uh, uh, Francis Carroll brought in. Francis, I thought it was great what you said about how you used them in your inn. Uh, what, it was in Old Line? In Old Line. We just, I just bought some of those, sent away some of those, and I framed them for pictures in the day. Wouldn't you like to go to an inn that had an Audubon <laughs> prince in the morning? 
wall. Well, we'll pass these around. And then the Francis also brought in. Um, now, I want to tell you a little bit about the process of the copper plate and lithograph. His first ones were done with a copper plate, which was quite expensive. To make a copper plate print, you first have to draw the picture, which of course Audubon did. Then in reverse, it has to be put on a large copper plate, and these were large pictures, with a little pointed utensil that digs little grooves into the copper plate. Then they take a roller, an ink roller, roll over the whole thing, then a, some way with a cloth, they wipe off that ink, and it's left in those little grooves. So you have the ink still in there in the design. Put the paper on, and it comes out right side, having been reversed on, the, on here. Then they had to, well, let's not worry. That's the last time. <laughs> I guess it's not as sticky as it should be. Um, then they had to be colored by the watercolorists. Now this was quite an expensive and long procedure. And um, Audubon had his done in England and a, and a very uh, talented um, copper plate artist named Robert Havel uh, did, the did the copper plates. Then Audubon would have to hover over the watercolors to make sure you get those, those colors just right. Well, there was a newer process that came to, along called lithography, which we know of, uh, particularly in the Courier and Ives prints. Those were lithographs. That's a different kind of process. It still has to be done in reverse, but you have a big stone, and you grease pencil your design onto it. Then you put water all over the, the stone, and the water stays in the places where the grease pencil wasn't. Then you ink it, and the ink only sticks to the grease pencil, not to the wet parts of the stone. And you put the paper on it, lift it up, and there it is. In the beginning, they still had to do the uh, hand water coloring. Since then, they've learned new, new ways of doing it, so they don't have to do any of that hand coloring. Um, now we'll move on to a brief outline of Audubon's early life before I show some slides. John James Audubon was born in Haiti, April 26th, 1785. His father was Jean Audubon, a lieutenant in the French Navy, a successful businessman and plantation owner who had properties in West Indies, France, and Pennsylvania. His mother was not his father's wife, who was living in France, but his mistress, a Mademoiselle Rabin. She died while John was an infant, and his father took him back to France, where his wife lovingly raised him as her own child. Um, from boyhood, uh, art and nature were just the passions of uh, Audubon, young John Audubon's life. As a child, he sketched birds on his father's estate, collected eggs and nests. He even tried taxidermy. Generally, his parents encouraged his interests, and he learned much about nature from the family physician, Dr. Charles Dorbini a leading French naturalist. He didn't like formal school, however, and ran away from the military academy that his father sent him to. However, he did have a short time of formal training with Jacques David in Paris, and he taught him several things. First, to draw carefully before you paint. Rule the paper off in squares to simplify sketching, and use flexible mannequins, which were a forerunner for a novel system that Audubon developed 
himself later, where he wired dead birds into positions uh, so that then he could, he could paint them. Um, his father worried, his poor father worried about a career for his son. And finally, he sent him uh, from France to, to America to a farm he owned in Pennsylvania, hoping he would eventually go into business. And at that point, I will uh, move over to my slides. And complete his life and works with the slides. Meg, do they have any siblings? Um, Audubon himself? <laughs> Not that I know of. I, I, they didn't talk about that. What did these early prints sell for? Do you have any? Uh, I have, have something in 79, I think it was 200,000 for one print, and that was quite a while ago. No, I mean originally. Originally? No, I don't. I don't. For, oh, you, you do? All right. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's see. Okay. In 1803, John James Audubon arrived at his father's land in Pennsylvania and moved into the lovely Mill Grove shown in the farming area here. At 18 years of age, he had little interest in business, either farming or in the local lead mine where his father had interests. In fact, he never had success with business there or in any other of his ventures for over 18 years in America. Two significant events occurred while he was living at, at Mill Grove. One, he fell in love with a wonderful person, Lucy Blakewell, who eventually became his wife. Second, he had the opportunity to hunt and roam in the woods. He began to take careful observations of Phoebe's in a cave nearby. They are shown here in a sketch he made a few years later. He watched their life cycle from the hatching of the eggs, and he thus became a student of bird behavior. Somehow he gained the trust of the birds and conducted what may have been the first banding experiment in the United States. He put a light silver thread on the baby bird's legs and observed that the birds returned the next year. As more evidence of his passion for nature was the following description someone made of a room at Mill Grove. On entering his room, I was astonished to find that it was turned into a museum. The walls were festooned with bird's eggs, carefully blown out and strung on a thread. The fireplace was covered with stuffed squirrels raccoons and opossums, and the shelves around were likewise crowded with specimens, among which were fishes, frogs, snakes, and lizards, and other reptiles. Besides, there were many paintings of birds on the wall. This is a self-portrait. In 1808, he and Lucy Blakewell were married a marriage that was have to, would have to endure many long celebrations, se separations, <laughs> celebrations, separations of many months while Audubon embarked on one business venture or another, or would go off for long trips searching for bird specimens. This self-portrait is similar to portraits that he painted for a while to help earn a few dollars. He was described as a handsome man, tall and slender, and though unassuming, was often the center of attention. His bride, Lucy, 
was also good looking, and she was respected and admired by others. I'm sorry I don't have a picture of her to show you, and I especially admire her for her ability to cope with her husband's long, long absences and handle the affairs at home and bring up their children uh, during the early years of their marriage. Audubon became attached to the United States and its wide outdoor spaces. He soon became an American citizen. And after their marriage, they moved <coughs> from Pennsylvania to Kentucky, where he tried having a backwoods general store and where their two sons, Victor and John, were born. He often left the store with his poor business partner and traveled down the Mississippi to Florida and then the whole East Coast at various times, all the way to Labrador, all the time seeking birds and making detailed, interesting journals about America in the early 1800s. His paintings of birds, as this flamingo from Florida, were in their natural settings quite different from the stuffed birds on pedestals that were the usual picture at that time. He observed them alive, then shot specimens for further scrutiny. He developed a system whereby he wired the specimens into natural poses for his sketches. In contrast to the southern birds, he had northern ones too, as this arctic tern that he took on a long trip around, that he painted on a long trip around Nova Scotia and up to Labrador and Newfoundland. He had to be aware of the timing of his trips to fit bird migrations so the birds would be there when he was. I'm always pleased to find that an artist I'm recording on has a sense of humor. Here are some fantastic imaginary fish that he drew with scientific seeming descriptions for a friend as a practical joke. He reminds me somewhat of Dr. Seuss. Life is not all a joke. It has its ups and downs. Once when Audubon returned for a joyful reunion with his wife in Henderson, he discovered that rats had eaten, you see the one running away there, had, had eaten a large number of his paintings. I was surprised to find this Japanese print of that sad event. So he's, he must have been well known in Japan, too. It was about this time that he became bankrupt. And he and his family lost their house and furniture as well. This p next picture is of Alexander Wilson, a painting by Rembrandt Peel, who was actually called the father of American ornithology. And Audubon had been aware of his work and that he had actually made it his career. After his own bankruptcy, Audubon, with Lucy's encouragement, decided to try to earn a living by being a naturalist and a bird artist. This was reinforced by years spent as a naturalist in the Natural History Museum of Cincinnati. Again, encouraged by his wife, Audubon decided to get his, his sketches of birds published in the collection he was to call Birds of America. With great determination, he embarked on earning some money uh, to, to uh, get this project going. He did landscapes, as this one. He did portraits. And both he and his wife were teachers. With the savings, and with paintings in hand, and in his woodsman's clothes, as in this self-portrait, he went to New York and then to, New to England looking for a publisher. Maybe it was partly his unusual clothes. Can you imagine someone like that 
arriving uh, in England. Um, but mostly, it was his knowledge from 20 years of travels that gave him instant fame at the age of 42. His 200 paintings were exhibited in England and Scotland, and he was in great demand as a lecturer. However, he still could not find a publisher. So he decided to find subscribers who would buy and pay for five prints at a time as they were made. As I mentioned before, the first set of 40, 435 Birds of America were life-size on large sheets of paper, 36 and a half by 26. And they were made using the copper plate method of engraving. They didn't have descriptions on each page, these uh, large prints. Um, instead, though, those who wished could buy his thousand page ornithological biography which he had written to go with the birds pictures. The most famous portrait of Audubon was by his son John Woodhouse Audubon. Both sons John and Victor had also become artists learning from their father all the skills of sketching and painting birds and animals. Victor, fortunately, also had some business skills. So finally, Lucy and the two grown-up sons joined him in England to complete the bird project. So he finally had the whole family together, and at last, he could provide well for them financially. When Audubon returned with his family to the United States, he purchased a house on 157th Street in New York City. He named it Minnie's Land, Minnie being Scottish for mother, and the name Minnie's, Minnie was what his children called their mother. This portrait also by John Woodhouse Audubon was painted at the end of a final trip in 1843 on the Missouri River to the Yellowstone. He and his sons painted animals, bison, and other western uh, animals, and brought back specimens and furs for further painting for the book on animals or quadrupeds of North America. My final group of slides are ones I chose as samples from Audubon's Birds of America and from quadrupeds of North America. The first plate of volume one is the wild turkey, probably the well, most well known. So I just take, a, I, I, these are very valuable I'm sure now since one was sold for 20,000 in 1979. So just look up in your attic and see what you can find. Uh, one of Audubon's sponsors had a turkey engraved on a ring as a gift to Audubon. Incidentally, backgrounds were often painted by others, especially by George Lehman, later by his sons John and Victor. This on the left is a copper printing plate from which the snowy owl was produced. You can see that the printing plate has to be opposite from the original. After printing, the picture, as shown on the right, was hand colored with watercolors. The pileated woodpecker is a stunning bird with its red crest. I didn't realize until now that its wingspan is 30 inches. Audubon has carefully included the branch, the leaves, and berries, just as it would have been seen in his woodland travels in many places in America. The meadowlark. Auto Audubon described the song of the meadowlark as fresh and as wild as if the wind were blowing through a flute. 
the meadowlarks are good allies for the farmers because they eat so many cutworms, caterpillars, and other insects. Here the family is shown with the nest hidden in the grass at the bottom and the golden-breasted male, bottom left, on the lookout. A botanist, Joe Mason, often painted or advised him about the plants and flowers. The whippoorwill, with its loud three-syllable call, is more likely to be heard than seen. Here, Audubon shows them in various positions, ready to catch the butterfly, the caterpillar. The butterflies are a colorful addition. Nature is not always so pretty, as for example, these two great-footed hawks who are tearing at the flesh of the ducks they are eating. Audubon describes them in this picture as two pirates eating their lunch, as it were, congratulating each other on the savoriness of the food in their grass. The cardinal is a favorite to many of us because of its color, particularly the red of the male. On the, at the top, and the variety of its songs. In Connecticut, it is now year-round. I did not realize until now that in the time of Audubon, cardinals were less abundant in northern states in Canada. But apparently milder winters and bird feeders have probably helped them broaden their range. The Carolina parakeets, with their colorful green, red, and yellow feathers, were once abundant over wide ranges of America, even as far as New York and Pennsylvania, and west to Wisconsin, Colorado, and Texas. But like the passenger pigeons, they are now extinct. Shot by the hundreds for their beautiful feathers, for sport, and by farmers whose corn they ate. Though Audubon carried a gun and did shoot specimens to paint, he began to be concerned about the senseless slaughter of the birds. He wrote in his journal, many species exceedingly abundant 20 years ago have abandoned their ancient breeding places. The war of extermination cannot last many years more. We know that his prediction is correct and that many of the birds he painted have indeed become greatly diminished in numbers or even extinct. As mentioned earlier, Audubon's final project was about animals, entitled The Quadrupeds of North America. These were done lithographs. Uh, the one shown is a 1967 version of that with the original plates and text. This was a collaborative effort with the help of Audubon's longtime friend John Backman in writing the text and both of his sons Victor and John in the painting and backgrounds. All the prints were lithographs. The illustrations and text were 1842 to 1854, this final project. So, this Virginia deer, these Virginia deer, are, is an example of the work of a son, John Woodhouse Audubon. Since the age of 21, he had traveled with his father and had become an artist and naturalist under his father's tutelage. Some say he probably did about half of the pictures in the animal book. Victor also did some, and in most cases it's not known which of the three Audubons painted each animal. And here we have the black bear painted on Audubon's final trip in 1843 on the Missouri River. Here again, as with the birds, it is a natural scene in the forest. 
in the text about the flying squirrels, Bachman and Audubon wrote, scores of these creatures would leave each tree at the same moment and cross each other, gliding like spirits through the air, seeming to have no other object in view than to indulge a playful propensity. Another small creature is the white-footed mouse, shown in a lovely pastoral setting, where I'd personally rather see it than in our house. And probably it's nicer for the mice, too, where they have plenty of nuts and seeds and insects and caterpillars to feast on. mink. Bachman and Audubon write that they have seen the mink in every state of the Union and that it prefers taking up residence on the borders of ponds and along the banks of small streams rather than along large and broad rivers. It delights in frequenting the fo foot of rapids and waterfalls as shown in the picture. Audubon considered the American bison a noble animal and the most important of our contemporary quadrupeds. He thought of it as a link with the extinct giant mastodons. mastodons. He feared that the slaughter related to our western move might cause the bison's numbers to be diminished to extinction as well. This is a bust of John James Audubon by Joy Buba, and I think it's in the New York Audubon Society headquarters. <laughs> Audubon spent his last years with his beloved Lucy in their New York home, Minnie's Land at 157, 157th Street, New York, overlooking the Hudson River. He died there on January 27, 1851, at the age of 65. At this point, I would like to summarize Audubon's contributions as an artist, as a naturalist, and a conservationist. As an artist, his work probably should be judged partly as illustration, with certain responsibilities to exactness which of course he fulfilled. But he invented his own style, the living bird in action and in its own habitat. He has had imitators, but none has quite equaled him. As a naturalist, the text of his ornithological biography and his journals show a scientist's thoroughness of observation. He was eyewitness to the teeming wildlife of America in the first half of the 19th century. Since then, many species, like the passenger pigeon, have become extinct or endangered. Yet Audubon, the naturalist, has given us detailed pictures and descriptions which will preserve them forever. As a conservationist, Audubon noted and deplored the vanishing wildlife, one of the first to do this. He began to realize that the wonders and natural resources are not endless. A former pupil of Lucy Blakewell Audubon, his wife, uh, first coined the term Audubon Society, and 40,000 members signed pledges not to kill non-game birds or to wear their feathers. Now the various Audubon societies have expanded their interests to practically every aspect of conservation and natural history, even whales. Audubon appears to have become the patron saint of conservationists. Oh, someone like to turn on the light? Well, thank you very much, Meg. That was a wonderful.